Hello, welcome to my channel, Medicine with Dr. Morin. The pandemic has now lasted two years, and a lot has been going on in terms of medical studies, public health, and a lot of other things. Now, what are the top 10 things that we could have done better with the current pandemic? These are not listed in order of importance, and depending on each person's situation, certain things will matter more than others. There are bookmarks for your convenience. There are other things too, but I've not mentioned them for obvious reasons. Let's go. Not allowing hospital visits during the pandemic. Preventing family members or visitors from going to the hospital to see their loved ones is very sad. Not being allowed to be there and comfort a sick or dying loved one is very traumatic both for the patient and the family. Preventing loved ones from being together at such times is detrimental and it does not help with the healing process. The power of social support at the time of hospitalization is therapeutic. We physicians see this all the time. An honorable mention has to go to harassment, censorship of COVID researchers and physicians. A recent survey of 510 COVID-19 researchers in the journal Science revealed that 38% reported at least one kind of harassment. Many of the researchers got personal insults, attacks on their professional capabilities, as well as allegations of dishonesty or corruption, to name a few. Attacks on social media were frequent and sad to see. There were even protests at hospitals. And this is not the way to treat healthcare workers or people, scientists, physicians, people like myself who are just trying to get across what's important in this pandemic. Protecting the elderly in nursing and long-term care homes. Proper mechanisms to protect the residents of these homes, basically to limit exposure to the virus, weren't in place in many countries. Rapid testing for healthcare workers at these homes would have been very beneficial. Also, putting COVID patients into these homes while still infectious was disastrous. Preventing spread in the homes is important due to the extra vulnerability of the residents. Also, allowing residents, when possible, to stay with family members and not be at extra risk in the nursing homes would have been helpful. There were nursing homes that didn't keep sick people separate from other residents. Number three, not allowing vaccine choice. Many countries only had one kind of vaccination. That was an mRNA vaccine. While this type of vaccine is very good at preventing severe disease, there are many people who for different reasons did not want to take this kind of vaccine. They still wanted to be vaccinated. Remember, people like choice. My patients always like choice. And in most aspects of medicine, there are different choices that we as physicians can present to patients with risks and benefits so that the individual patient can choose a solution that best fits their need. Many patients have wanted more traditional vaccines such as Novavax, Covaxin, or even AstraZeneca or J&J, &J. but those have not always been available for access in certain countries. Number four, only instructing people to stay at home. Shelter in place instructions could have been much better. And during times of restrictions, public health messaging should have been very pro-health, explaining to people that staying in your home can lead to eating more, eating the wrong kind of foods, and of course leading to a lack of exercise. Many of my patients joked about their COVID-19, the extra 19 pounds that they put on with the pandemic, but it's not funny. It obviously will lead to things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and generally will reduce someone's health and possibly even mobility, depending on how much weight you put on. There were public health broadcasts every day, but I've never seen one where anyone taught people how to improve their immune system and their overall health. They never even suggested things like exercise and eating healthy. I think those were things that were important, but were missed. Natural immunity not being accepted. Many countries ignored the protection of natural immunity for those who were fortunate enough to survive the illness. Reinfections have been very uncommon and generally much less severe through Delta. With Omicron, things have changed. There have been more reinfection in recovered patients, but we're also seeing a lot of infections in the vaccinated group as well. I've talked extensively in a number of videos on this topic. 
Now, in some countries, healthcare workers were fired, leading to shortages in the pool of workers by not giving some credit to natural immunity. Masking. Again, we're two years into the pandemic and there's only been two randomized masking trials. I've talked about these on the channel in previous videos. Just to recap briefly, one study was in Denmark and it didn't show a statistically significant benefit of surgical masks in preventing COVID. The numbers were 2.1% versus 1.8%. Although in fairness, it may not have had enough patients and had the power to detect those two numbers, a difference in those numbers. Now, the other study was from Bangladesh and they had over 300,000 participants. And this did not demonstrate any benefit of a three-ply cloth mask, not the usual one you see on the street. It did show an 11% reduction from a surgical mask, which was statistically significant. Now, we don't know the benefits of masking young children, if any. In North America, kids two and above were masked, but the WHO did not recommend masking for kids under the age of six. Better quality medical research. While there has been an enormous amount of high quality research, some has been disappointing. On the positive side, the UK recovery trial has brought us four different medications which we now use to treat COVID. The TOGETHER trial, which was a Canadian-Brazilian platform-based randomized controlled trial using repurposed drugs, found that fluvoxamine was helpful as I previously reported. Now, these kind of randomized double-blinded trials are the best kind of medical research where we randomly allocate patients who meet entry criteria to either the active intervention or drug versus no intervention or placebo, and we enroll enough patients so that we can be confident whether the intervention is helpful or not. Now, the TOGETHER trial did look at ivermectin in a randomized fashion and failed to show benefit from ivermectin. This is unpublished data still. I've talked about many observational studies on this channel which have serious limitations. Typically, they're looking at two groups that they're trying to compare, and the two groups are often not the same, and so the results at the end of the study can't be believed. Many studies have significant bias within them, and it's a key to try to spot that, and it's something that we've seen during this pandemic, these sorts of bias trials. For example, recently there were two observational ivermectin studies that had significant limitations because the group of people getting ivermectin were very different from the group that didn't receive ivermectin. Thus, the conclusions in these two recent studies or papers that I looked at weren't worth reading, and they're obviously not practice changing. Quite a few preprints have been questioned as to their validity also. The surges for your database early in the pandemic was utilized in positive ivermectin studies, and that database was questioned and was ultimately found to be inaccurate. Several peer-reviewed studies, which were published in well-respected medical journals, were actually subsequently retracted. Now, this is why medical research needs to be critically appraised and not just accepted at face value like it has been during this pandemic. It then gets picked up by the media or the internet, and suddenly it's accepted as fact, even though the study is not practice changing. Now, there's still some trials two years into the pandemic that are yet to be completed, including a number of ivermectin studies. Many on social media with large followings continue to promote ivermectin and state that it's the biggest pandemic mistake, that this drug has not been used more widely. Now, the overwhelming majority of doctors do not prescribe this, and in fact, many would lose their license if they were to. Frankly, the best research with the least amount of bias has shown no benefit with ivermectin, and we will know soon as there are about to be released some randomized studies on this medication. I do think it's highly unlikely that ivermectin will be shown to have any benefit, and that's why I've not talked about this on my channel. Now, remember when you don't know whether a medication is going to work in medicine, what you need to do? Study it quickly in a randomized trial rather than just prescribe it. We need answers and we need answers quickly. And that's something that was a mistake in this pandemic. Next, number eight, hoarding vaccines and letting doses of vaccines expire. Many first world countries have had large amounts of vaccines on hand so that people can get three or even four shots before many people at risk in other countries even have a chance to get their first vaccination. 
the more people around the world who are protected, the less variants we're going to see and the less global deaths. Many doses of vaccines have expired without being sent to other countries in need. If you can shop online and get delivery within 24 hours of what you've just paid for, why can't these doses be sent to countries in need within days? Not spacing vaccine doses to an optimal time frame. Some countries, including Canada and the UK, tried to vaccinate as many people in high-risk categories with a single dose before starting over again with a second dose. And they did this when vaccine quantities were at a very low amount. Now, the first dose provided just over 80% protection against infection, and the second brought it up to 95%. Other countries like the US did not do this, and they went with a three-week or a four-week spacing between their two doses of mRNA vaccines. Now, spacing the dose out further would have saved many more lives, because spacing out the vaccine makes the vaccine more effective and lowers the side effect profile. I've talked extensively on the channel about this. An eight-week interval between the first and second injections appears to be optimal. It was also shown in Canada to reduce the uncommon side effect of myocarditis. Myocarditis was more common after the second dose and more common when the Moderna mRNA vaccine was given, and it's on the order of one in two and a half thousand in young males after their second Moderna dose. Many countries have not been using Moderna for people under 30 because of that reason. Recently, I must say, the CDC in the U.S. did change their guidance on vaccine intervals to bring it more in line with the rest of the world. And the number one mistake during this pandemic is to simply get healthy. Or if you are, stay healthy. People in good health are much more likely to successfully survive COVID-19 with fewer symptoms and less duration of illness. It's a time where people really should have been trying to optimize their health and reverse their comorbidities if they have any. I have had a number of my patients who have successfully lost large amounts of weight and improved their blood pressure and sugar control and cholesterol during this time. Even with the restrictions, people should have tried to get three to five hours of moderate intensity exercise a week. For some people, this can be done inside, even if it's in the winter and 30 below, or you can go outside by simply walking or doing other activities. People's health has gone down due to the pandemic with weight gain, reduced glucose, and poor blood pressure control, amongst other things. Many people have struggled with their mental health. That has been one of the most problematic parts of the whole pandemic. I think an increasing number of people have had a lot of these long COVID symptoms but actually have never had COVID. Now, what I mean by that is that people who have never had COVID often feel fatigued, depressed, find it difficult to concentrate, have brain fog and so on. And that's simply because of the pandemic. It's been a very challenging time for many people. Thanks for joining me today on Medicine with Dr. Morin. I'm Dr. Keith Morin and remember, get healthy and stay healthy.